Vintage racing is a beautiful thing. It's a place where people can build their dreams, restore their dreams, uh, and go race and have an amazing sport with people. What I saw happening is vintage racing being destroyed quickly. The mentality and philosophy in this article is dangerous. If you're mad about this video, dear people in vintage racing, um, I like you, but get over yourself for a second. I'd like the sport to continue. KW makes the perfect suspension for every demand. Find them in the description below. What's up, people? Well, today I want to talk about the sport of vintage racing and its future. Recently, on my Facebook, I saw an old article pop up that relates to vintage racing, drivers, their perceived talent levels, and licenses. Now, it's a very old article, so there's no reason it should have popped up. However, some random person commented on it recently, and that triggered the algorithm enough on social media for it to come up to me. Probably because the algorithm know it'll make me very mad. <laughs> because the philosophy behind that article and how it was being angled toward the sport of vintage racing is the same philosophy that is destroying basically anything good in the world right now, hardcore. So we're gonna talk about that. The other aspect of vintage racing, and this is something that's destroying the sport for the future, and I'm gonna articulate exactly how it is because people could argue it one way when it's really another way. I'm just saying it's, it's, it's two-way street. Earlier this year, I was at a vintage race, one that I love. In fact, it was the same event that was my very first vintage race that was like two weeks after I graduated college. See, when I was in college, I worked as a part-time Ferrari mechanic, believe it or not, doing major services on things like 308s and Testarossas and such, and it was really cool. And the guys that owned the shop were nice enough that uh, I bought an old 1957 Triumph-powered Devon. And the car wasn't finished, so I needed to work on it, and they let me work on it on the nights and weekends when I wasn't working on customer Ferraris. And two weeks after I graduated college, back in 2005, I put my sleeping bag and toolbox and little spares and stuff in my Devon. I drove it on the, on the roadway all the way in mid-Ohio, raced it, had the time of my life, uh, fell in love with the sport of vintage racing, and I drove it home. So awesome. And so I've seen it from that time period, the last 15 years, the kinds of cars that come, the demographic of people, the age group, what people are interested in, where the sponsors come from, where the monies are, what the leadership is doing and promoting and where are they potentially going with it. So at the most recent event that also relates to this philosophy, this article, what I saw happening is vintage racing being destroyed quickly. And I hadn't been at the event in a few years and the telltale signs that I had of it destroying the sport were the type of cars uh, were waning hardcore. The groups were being mixed and we were seeing a varied grouping of like different eras of formula cars stuck together with sports races and stuff. Things that before would have had separate groups, separate races for them were all being grouped together, which starts to show me when it's declining because the car count isn't there. And one of the things that never would get reported on is that there were so many of the most incredible cars, vintage race cars, I'm talking amazing, slick tired, winged Formula 5000s, we're talking two liter uh, European sports racing Le Mans cars, they were way out in the gravel and grass of like where you normally camp. But what was in the paddock were the very big and very high end um, shops that do it, the big glitz trucks and trailers, the super wealthy and their trucks and trailers, and some other series, which to be honest, you gotta be pretty dang wealthy to be in. And what I saw was that a gentrification of a series, a vintage racing group, and these other groups coming into it is driving out the meat and potatoes of what vintage racing was. And they weren't just people that weren't the wealthiest ones, they were the people that weren't a big shop or weren't the centimillionaires sponsoring everything. And what's gonna happen is those people are so far away from the paddock and the, the track with their amazing cars that they work on that matter for safety and all, driving through rocks and gravel, that they're not gonna to wanna to come back to that event. It's also not entirely safe to have amazing cars like that way out in the gravel. And it's so sad because that particular event used to just be the vintage race and there were 10 to 12 groups of amazing vintage cars throughout history, but different ones of those races and groups would shrink down and be combined because that sanctioning body kept trying to get other race sanctioning bodies together un under an umbrella, which I, I just call spade a spade. 
but it's, they're gonna get mad at me because they always get mad at people to criticize them. They got formula f they got one, they got two, and they favor all the people with money. So in the actual paved area was all that. Formula f is not remotely vintage. It's wealthy teenagers that buy a ride and do it. That's not vintage racing. That's not what people have been coming decades to see. And those kids crash all the time. So it's a disheartening race to watch, especially if you're an older gentleman who really enjoys it and has an amazing Le Mans car or a Formula car or something amazing. It keeps them not wanting to come back. And then one and two might be cool racing and all, but it's not vintage, but it is a bunch of wealthy people. And the problem is with vintage racing, this happens everywhere. You get more and more interesting people. And if you start favoring the people with money, or trying to get other groups and jamming it all in to be a bigger deal and effectively grow yourself a bigger organization or social climb or whatever it is for the benefit, you end up driving out, like I said, the meat and potatoes and the every man that do it. And you start looking at the entry count, how much this costs and everything like this, and it's like, this doesn't even make sense. So what I saw was by effect for whatever the end means is, whether they want to build up a big business and make it a big deal and one day sell it or just have more value or connected to more high-end people, that's all fine. You can do that. But the problem is by narrowing racing, or in this circumstance, finish racing down to make it more gentrified, you kill it because you kill everybody else coming. They're not going to want to come. They're not getting any. It just, it just ruins it. So they either have to start another sanctioning body or they quit. And in this circumstance, the people are getting older, so they're probably just gonna quit. And that kills the sport, because then they never get the opportunity to pass it down to young people. And that's why for the last 10 years or whatever, I've been you know, helping young people come out and do that and be part of it. It's a whole separate talk. But, and I know this because even me that loves it so much and am younger by means of vintage racing, I was honestly thinking, yeah, I think I'm done with this. That event sucked. That wasn't vintage racing. It was sad to see. We get less track time. We're out here in the sticks and rocks. Uh, I think we might be done. So that is a negative effect. So if they just want to make it an extreme, high-end, wealthy, sophisticated thing with a bunch of series and stuff, great. But you're going to kill what it was, vintage racing. Um, and when I got there, I was so disappointed. I'm like, it used to be called the Vintage Grand Prix uh, forever. And I'm like, I feel like they should rename this event. This isn't even vintage racing. Turned out they did rename the event. <laughs> and then you also see it with this, the spectators and such that is doom and gloom. But what's interesting about that is by trying to make the event higher end, more, more money, higher end people, higher end series and stuff like that, you start killing it. The same philosophy with this article uh, also will kill it. Now this article the title of it is, May I See Your License? Now, it's a very old article, I think actually from 2000. Uh, but someone recently commented on it and it propagated the algorithm to pop up on my Facebook, probably because the algorithm know it would tick me off. But the mentality and philosophy in this article is dangerous because that philosophy is what is destroying everything in America, modern time. And May I See Your License may as well translate to the old joke about Germany asleep. Papers and registration, please. And the difficulty is effectively what this article was doing was talking about how they were trying to boil it down where in vintage racing, there's a lot of extremely powerful and exciting cars that require skill to drive throughout history, whether it's a Can-Am car, or a Formula 5000 car or anything like this. And they don't necessarily have the entirety of modern safety considerations like a newer car would. You know, they have to have fuel bladders and they have to be checked and inspected and all that. And they're tech inspected and they're all fine pedal and everybody's wearing good safety gear. And I found vintage racing to be very safe over all the years and people to make good choices. But what this article is talking about comes down to self-responsibility. And what happens is you get people nowadays who through fear mongering or grandstanding for the, the veil of safety are doing it to control others, um, whether it needs to happen or not. And in this circumstance, this article was going on and they tried to give an example about the FAA um, and licensing for different aircraft, which has validity, but is also sad because civil aviation is declining too. Um, but I'm not gonna get into that. But what, what's happened here is if you take vintage racing and you start mandating that people have to have a certain amount of hours or a certain amount of things in certain cars before they can move something else up, you're going to destroy it immediately. And if you don't destroy it immediately, 
it will favor only the wealthy people that can do that, which also inherently destroys the sport and is what has destroyed the sport in the other circumstance. And the sad part about this is it doesn't need to be. You don't need to suddenly force people in racing to have all these different licenses. That already exists, basically. One, it's called the self-responsibility of knowing whether you should drive this or not. And yeah, maybe somebody buys a car, it's a little hot for them, they're like, holy crap, this thing's insane. And they're either slow, because they're being safe, or they run it one time and quit. And you don't have to worry about it. Vintage racing is a beautiful thing. It's a place where people can build their dreams, restore their dreams, uh, and go race and have an amazing sport with people. But when you try to have control over it by mandating extra things about licensing and stuff, you make it more exclusive to only favor the wealthy and you push everybody else out. If you take a sanctioning body and then try to add other races and sanctioning bodies to it, they're all very high end and which inherently only favors the wealthy, the CEOs or the big um, shops that do it, you also kill it because then everybody else decides, forget this. I don't, I don't need this anymore, or they go somewhere else. And I'm doing this video because it's destroying vintage racing. Those guys are getting older, there's no succession planning, it's changing, and I'm watching the groups turn to crap. Um, and clearly, I like vintage racing. And it's happening because of human nature, which is greed and control. So I would just simply say vintage racing has been an amazing thing for a few decades, run very safely by different sanctioning bodies from the HSR, the SBRA, the SCDA. I mean, just all these different great places. And sure, there's accidents here, there. I mean, they are cars going fast. And you know what? There's been older gentlemen who maybe have a heart attack or something like that because it's hot. But the fact that vintage racing over all these years has been able to take something that inherently has risk and make it generally safe is a really good thing. And a com key component of making the sport safe and continuing on is a concept called self-responsibility. Because the people generally there are people that have been responsible for their own lives and others. People that are maybe leaders of business or industry. And we're all in it together. So when I see an article trying to suggest that we put all these different licenses on it, I would simply say, Karen, go get yourself a cup of warm tea, go far away from the scary racetrack, read a book, and shut your mouth. Because it's people like that that are literally destroying everything good in America by grandstanding on the thin veil BS of safety and making it so that nobody can enjoy anything responsibly on their own anymore which in turn basically just favors the wealthy. And getting to the point is, if either of these two things happened in vintage racing when I started, I never would have been able to continue doing that. I never been able to be part of that sport. I would not have been able to grow and continue. I would not have been able to have a shop, bring people into the sport, um, restore many cars for the sport that are still out there racing, or even start something like Genius Garage that gets people jobs. So I think we need to realize all together, whether it's a sport like vintage racing as a whole, a community, or a nation, it takes a lot of people coming together to do it. And I think we need to stop controlling others and just favor doing things that either directly or indirectly only favor people with means. Let's all just be cool, have a little self-responsibility and get it going. But I gotta say, this article, uh, it's an old article, but it's still relevant and says, may I see your license? I vehemently disagree with it. I hate the article. I hate the philosophy behind it. And I think the person's just trying to do a power gain and stir things up. And I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is. So if there's a vintage racing sanctioning body out there, that's a good one, and I'll deem that for myself, and you need some sort of spokesperson or some positive public figure to talk about how great the sport is and valuable for the future, well, I volunteer. And I got a pretty big mouth. <laughs> and I know how the future works uh, pretty well. So that's all I got, guys. I hope you guys subscribe, hit that bell, and I'll see you next time. And if you're mad about this video, dear people in vintage racing, um, I like you, but get over yourself for a second. I'd like the sport to continue. Well, a huge thank you to Crush Proof Tubing Company. Since 1949 in Macomb, Ohio, they've been manufacturing custom rubber and plastic tubes for every industry imaginable. No tooling or mold costs, 
fast and free custom samples, and American-made quality is what sets them apart. But for me, I'm most excited about their exhaust evacuation kit. Different modular pieces and their convoluted custom hoses make it so that I can adapt any car, truck, or motorcycle with an internal combustion engine to get those exhaust gases out of my shop so I can keep working in safety and comfort. But beyond just that, they build a variety of hoses for a custom OEM world. You'll see stretchable drain tubing and bellows, as well as agriculture, medical, and military. So again, guys, Crush Proof Tubing Company, crushproof.com, and go down in the description below to see where to get your free samples for industry or your exhaust tubing.